Okay. All right. So take a deep breath, breathing in the spirit of God, and let us uh, prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning and welcome uh, and happy Mother's Day. Welcome to First Presbyterian Church because First Presbyterian is wherever the people of First Presbyterian are. Uh, there is always a lot happening with our community, even in this time that we are all distanced at this point. Uh, but I, uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out before we got started is just that we haven't been doing moments of fellowship or passing of the peace during this time of worshiping by Zoom. But over the course of this next week, I'd like to encourage everyone to reach out uh, and to pass the peace in whatever way you can, um, making sure that we can still stay connected in whatever way we can, um, in new and creative, imaginative ways uh, as, we, um, as we continue to be socially distanced. And with that, I'd like to invite everyone to join with me in the call to worship that's found in our bulletins. Glorify the Lord, all you works of the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. In the firmament of his power, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, you angels and all the powers of the Lord, O heavens and all the waters above the heavens. Sun and moon and stars of the sky, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord every shower of rain and fall of dew, all winds and fire and heat. Winter and summer, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O chill and cold, drops of dew and flakes of snow, frost and cold, ice and sleet, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. Glorify the Lord, O nights and days, O shining light and enfolding dark, storm clouds and thunderbolts, glorify the Lord. Praise him and highly exalt him forever. And with that, I'd like to invite you to join in our first hymn, In Christ There Is No East or West.
God calls us into the desert, but we follow reluctantly. Let us confess our sins and commit ourselves to following the path God has chosen for us. Let us pray the prayer of confession together. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you have shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry, and we pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to the calls for peace. We despise the weak and abuse the earth you made. Forgive us, God of mercy. Help us to trust in your power to change our lives. To make us new, that we may know the life of abundant given in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. The grace of Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Living God, with joy we celebrate the presence of your risen word. Enliven us by our Holy Spirit so that we may proclaim the good news of eternal and abundant life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The gospel reading is from Matthew 6, verses 26 to 29, and it's a good one. Basically, it states, don't worry, God will take care of you. For look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying at a single hour, the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. The word of the Lord. Thanks, thanks to be to God. This has been another one of those weeks when I started out writing one sermon and then had to change course by the end of the week. A couple days ago, I joined many around the country, including some of you, in walking 2.23 miles. It was an act of honoring the life and being in solidarity with the family of Ahmad Aubrey. On February 23rd, this young man was out for a jog when two white supremacists saw him, got their guns, approached them in, in their truck, and then killed him in broad daylight. And for months, these two men had been walking free, thinking that they'd been entitled to it. They had power and connections. They had privileges that come with white skin. And so this past Friday, May 8th, on what would have been Ahmad's 25th birthday, People around the country ran or walked 2.23 miles. And as I joined in, I thought about his life. And I thought about my own privilege at being able to walk around town without fear. And I wondered what all this says about trying to live into the way of Jesus in this time that we live in. It can be unsettling and frustrating to write sermons that try to connect our faith to what's happening in this world because way too often it's the same tragedies that keep coming up just on different weeks. I've had to preach way too often on white supremacy and gun violence, and it doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. And I realize that for a congregation that's mostly made up of white folks, uh, and with myself being white too, it could be easy to just pass it by and to move on to something else. We have the privilege to pretend like it doesn't affect us. We have a history of not taking responsibility for racist systems of power. And yet to not address this tear in our humanity would, to be stray, would be to stray far from the way of Jesus. We know our story, but we have to retell it over and over again so that it can become embedded in us as our understood identity and our way of life. 
we retell it week after week so that we know how to live into our fullest God created selves. We know our story. Our creator designed us for shalom, wholeness, that experience of oneness with God and with all of creation. We haven't always lived into that life that God made for us. Our insecurities and defenses have caused us to stray far from shalom. We stray by ignoring the needs of others and by choosing instead to be motivated by our own pride and greed. Even so, our creator loves all of creation and keeps seeking to restore us to our created state of shalom. The way of God, therefore, is to live into God's shalom. And if our story tells us anything, it is that our ability to live into our shalom design is dependent on others being able to live into their created design of shalom. Now, the way our culture understands the world around us, our epistemology is individualistic, and that can make it difficult for us to understand the stories of scripture in the ways that the Israelites did. Uh, because the way the Israelites understood the world was through a communal epistemology. When they talked about God being angry about injustice, it wasn't just about finding blame in a couple individuals who acted destructively. God was hurt by the community's collective guilt at allowing destructive systems that permitted the people's greed or violence or faithlessness to persist. The Israelites couldn't separate the individuals from the interdependent community. They confessed their sins collectively because it was understood that they stood together as a community in need of repentance and healing. The practice of obeying God's commandments wasn't just about individuals figuring out how to live well on their own, but figuring out the commandments was how, but living out the commandments was how the community lived into their created design as interdependent people. If one person killed another person, it not only hurt the victim, but the tear in the shared humanity would destroy the entire community. If one person stole from someone else, it would hurt the entire community. And if someone didn't share in Sabbath rest and didn't support their family and workers and neighbors in resting on the Sabbath, then it would keep the entire community from living into God's shalom design. The practice of Sabbath often gets pigeonholed to just mean coming to the church building on Sunday mornings and attending worship out of a sense of obligation or habit, but it's so much richer and more important than any of that. We practice resting on the seventh day because we are a part of this ongoing story as God's people. And it is through this practice of Sabbath that we allow God's grace to become the rhythm of our lives. Over the last month, we've been exploring Barbara Brown Taylor's An Altar in the World. And I'd like to read her words about what she has learned about the Jewish practice of lighting two candles at the Friday evening Shabbat service. And as I read it, I'd like to invite you to notice how practicing Sabbath can help us to learn to love our neighbors. According to those who know, there is one candle for each of the Sabbath commandments in Torah, both of which call God's people to be more like God. The first commandment is based on the creation account in Genesis. You can tell by the way that it ends. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that, it is, that, all that is in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God worked hard for six days and then God rested, performing the consummate act of divine freedom by doing nothing at all. Furthermore, the rest was so delicious that God did not call it good or even very good. Instead, God blessed the seventh day and called it holy, making Sabbath the first sacred thing in all creation. Resting every seventh day, God's people remember their divine creation. That is what the first Sabbath candle announces. Made in God's image, you too shall rest. The second candle stands for the second formulation of the Sabbath commandment in, in Deuteronomy 5. There, the basis of the command shifts from the creation of the world to the exodus from Egypt, ending this way. 
Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. God's people cried out to God, and God heard them, sending Moses to free them from bondage in a land that was not home. Resting every seventh day, God's people remember their divine liberation. That is what the second Sabbath candle announces. Made in God's image, you too are free. When observant Jews light two candles on Shabbat, they light one for each of these therefores, a rest candle and a freedom candle, which have more to do with each other than may be apparent at first. By interrupting our economically sanctioned social order every week, Sabbath practice suspends our subtle and not so subtle ways of dominating one another on regular basis. Because our work is so often how we both rank and rule over one another, resting from it gives us a rest from our own pecking orders as well. When the Walmart cashier and the bank president are both lying on picnic blankets at the park, it's hard to tell them apart. When two sets of grandparents are at the lake with their grandchildren feeding ducks, it's hard to tell the rich ones apart from the poor ones. If Bible lovers paid as much attention to Leviticus 25 as to Leviticus 18, then we might discover that God is at least as interested in economics as in sex. According to the astounding chapter of Torah, Sabbath is not, o Sabbath is not only about getting a little rest, but also about freeing slaves, forgiving debts, restoring property, and giving the land every seventh year off. From Leviticus 25. Six years you may sow your field, and six years you may prune your vineyard and gather in its yield. But in the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest, a Sabbath of the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vines. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. But you may eat whatever the land during its Sabbath will produce. You, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers who live with you, and your cattle and the beasts in the land may eat all its yield. Sabbath is not only God's gift to those who have voices to say how tired they are. Sabbath is also God's gift to the tired fields, the tired vines, the tired vineyard, the tired land. Leviticus 25 shows divine concern for grapes, for God's sake. It promises both the tame and the wild animals in the land enough to eat, along with the hired hands who presumably have time to take up woodworking and water aerobics during that year that the tractors stay parked in the barn. Sabbath is the great equalizer, the great reminder that we do not live on this earth but in it and that everything we do under the warming tent of this planet's atmosphere affects all who are woven into this web with us. Church, take a deep breath, breathing in the spirit of God and breathing God out into the world. Breathing in the spirit and breathing the spirit out. And as you continue to breathe, consider what Sabbath rest feels like for you right now. In this time of global pandemic, what does it look like for us to follow God's lead and to rest like our creator rested? What does it look like now to allow ourselves to recover? And what does it look like to allow our global and local community to rest and recover? I know that the season that we're in is hard. There is so much that is frustrating and disappointing, and there's a lot to grieve in this unexpected time of sheltering in place. I know that we're antsy and it's tempting to break quarantine and to rush back into whatever life was like before. So consider it from the perspective of Leviticus 25. What does it look like to view staying at home as a kind of Sabbath practice? How could we practice Sabbath rest as, excuse me, how can we practice Sabbath rest as staying home and staying safe so that workers in hospitals and other risky environments are allowed to be safe during this time? 
consider how people of color and marginalized communities around God's world are disproportionately suffering from this pandemic due to the types of jobs they get pushed into and the lack of needed health care and the lack of access to resources. What does it look like to stand in solidarity with our marginalized global neighbors, understanding that we are all interconnected and that our ability to live into our shalom design is wrapped up in others being able to live into shalom themselves. If our shalom wholeness and even just our safety is interdependent with others' wholeness and safety, how does that change who we go out of our way to care for? In the week ahead, I encourage you to sit with the scripture passage of Leviticus 25 and allow God to keep speaking to you. Allow the Spirit of God to offer up new interpretations about what it looks like to rest as God rested and to allow others to do so as well. May we recognize that the shalom wholeness of one affects the shalom of us all, and may we choose to follow God. May it be so. Amen. And with that, I'd like to invite us to our next hymn. Thank you. Friends, please join me in our affirmation of faith, which is found in our bulletin. We believe in the debonair God who clothes the wildflowers, dressing them so superbly that they outdo Solomon in all his glory, who is the true friend of all creatures, great and small, who feeds magpies and laughing kookaburras, and even doleful ra ravens and drongos. We believe in the God of Christ Jesus, the source of abundance, full of grace and truth. We believe in the extravagant God who turns the other cheek, goes the second mile, turns water into the best wine, brings healing with his every touch, and who welcomes a woman's love as she fills the house with unforgettable fragrance. We believe in the faithful God of Jesus Christ, who sweated blood in an olive grove and kept the faith to the very end. We believe in the redeeming God who spared no cost, forgave even his brutal crucifiers, had time for a dying thief at his side, and who on the third day did a thing so prodigious that even his friends were dismayed with joy. We believe in the God of Jesus Christ, the source of abundance, wherever we turn and no matter what we do. Amen. 
In the spirit of the first believers, we are called to share the good, we are called to share our goods in common and contribute to the needs of the poor with glad and generous hearts. Friends, we might not be able to pass the offering plate from pew to pew this morning, but if you are able to contribute your offering to the needs of the church and, and the world, please know that the address is at the, of the church is at the end of your bulletin, so you can send your, your offering in. And with that, let's come before God in the spirit of prayer. In this time of COVID-19, we pray. When we aren't sure, God, help us to be calm. When information comes from all sides, correct and not, help us to discern. When fear makes it hard to breathe and anxiety seems to be the order of the day, slow us down, God. Help us to reach out with our hearts when we can't touch with our hands. Help us to be socially connected when we have to be socially distant. Help us to love as perfectly as we can, knowing that perfect love casts out all fear. For the doctors, we pray. For the nurses, we pray. For the technicians and the janitors and the aides and the caregivers, we pray. For the researchers and theorists, the epidemiologists and the investigators, for those who are sick and for those who are grieving, we pray. For all who are affected all around the world, we pray. For safety, for health, and for wholeness. May we feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and house those without homes. May we walk with those who feel that they are alone, and may we do all that we can to heal the sick in spite of the epidemic, in spite of the fear. Help us, O oh God, that we might help each other. In the name of the Creator, in the name of the Healer, and in the name of the Holy Spirit that is in all and with all, we pray. May it be so. And now let us join our voices together from wherever we are to pray our word, pray the words Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us join in our final hymn, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Beloved family of God, may the love of the holy triune God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, abide with you forever. Alleluia. Now go forth in Jesus' name, remembering his new commandment to love one another just as he has loved us. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm.